Hello YouTube, this is DieFlyFish. Just want to show you another experiment that I did. This is one of my crystal cells with a piece of copper and the electrolyte material utilizing the zinc oxide, epsom salt mix, galena, iron pyrite. I added to this mix just a little bit of tin oxide um, for Grimm's. And I just want to show you something. The, the construction of this cell is a little bit different. <clears throat> I placed at the interface of the electrolyte material, an infinitely thin piece of stainless steel mesh, okay? And the reason why I did this is I wanted to note what was exactly happening during the polarization phase to see, you know, where the electrolysis was. And what I noted was that, you know, there's a very, very even type of um, electrolytic activity that occurs. And this material has been drying for the last couple days. So it's hard. And I just want to show you an interesting verification of the piezo effect. Now, normally I have the, obviously the positive terminal hooked up to the copper and I have placed this piece of stainless steel as the negative terminal. And I'll show you what the voltage is <coughs> when we do that. Now, when I touch the negative electrode to the stainless steel mesh, we're registering this form of voltage, okay? So it's nothing extraordinary by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it's interesting, okay? Now, what I found even more interesting is if I take this electrode and if I just press it on the material itself, watch, depending on where I touch it, we will see voltages higher as seen over a volt, half a volt. And if we press firmly, we will see a marked increase in voltage. So over and above what we're touching when we touch the negative electrode. So there's definitely something else going on here. Again, we saw there's over one volt right there. And I'm pressing on the material itself. I'm not pressing on any form of the metal. So the pressure, the firmer I press, the more voltage I'm getting out of this. So there's definitely the piezo effect here. As far as I'm concerned, that's verified because I'm just pressing on the electrolyte right now. And I'm able to get upwards of a volt depending upon where I'm touching it and I'm only on the material itself. So for what it's worth, this material, or the electrolyte, does add to the explanation as far as what's going on here. So if I press firm here, I lighten it up and it goes down. It's pressure sensitive for sure. I thought you might find that interesting. Again, just touch the stainless steel, 0.134. So for what it's worth, it's interesting material. Hey guys, Stackfly Fish. Just want to show you an interesting phenomenon. I took my Oreo cell and I wet the interface, and I noted that this definitely can disassociate very quickly. Okay, and I put it back together again, and I have not polarized this since the original polarization. But I want to show you something. Remember IB saying that it shouldn't go above you know, 100 millivolts or whatever when we're doing this. So I'm going to see if I can hold this in position and I'll register this for you. Watch, watch this phenomenon. I just disassociated that and just put the two pieces of carbon back together again. And this is where it's going. And I'm not quite sure why. So this is fascinating because this is simply you know, the carbon-carbon cell. And she's still climbing. So we have carbon-carbon cell now at coming up on 200 millivolts. Now it's over that, so we'll go to the 2-volt range.
And again, I would not expect this type of scenario from an identical um, electrode type of scenario. So here we have, you know, 0.25 volts, quarter of a volt from identical electrodes. Good evening YouTube, this is Die Fly Fish. This video I'm going to show you the modus in which I have mixed the electrolyte for the zinc oxide Epsom salt battery. First I'd like to show you a potential important difference between normal Epsom salts and what I've been using. In a previous video I showed you that I was using the lavender type Epsom salts which are permeated with a lavender fragrance but I've noticed that there may be a constituent difference between the two between normal Epsom salts and this lavender based Epsom salts. If you notice this is the constituent of normal Epsom salt. This is the constituency of the lavender permeated Epsom salts that I've purchased at a local pharmacy. But if you notice what the ingredients are, Mag sulfate, fragrance, potassium, zinc, and calcium silicate. So there's just a bit more to be found within this form of lavender soak Epsom salts than the normal Epsom salts. So for what it's worth, um, I'm using this bit of kit and it has in it just a bit more material than the normal form of Epsom salts. And we'll continue in a moment. Okay, here we have the Epsom salts lavender mix here we have some elemental galena. As you can see, this is where I've been scarring away a little bit with a, a diamond file for the doping. Now, the next step that I normally take is that I dope the magnesium sulfate first. If you notice, this is very white and crystalline. If you notice, it's you know perfectly white and or clear. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the galena and I'm going to dope this material. So I take a diamond file like this doesn't take much about like so, okay? And if you notice, what you see in there is just a little sprinkling. It's not very much, okay? Let me add just a few more scratches of that for good measure. It's sort of like what you'd sprinkle on eggs if you wanted some pepper. Okay? Now, if you notice, that's what you have to start with, okay? Now I'm going to show you what happens when you mix this. It turns that entire crucible full extraordinarily gray. So it turns it from a white mix to a very, very, very gray mix, if you notice that. I'm just mixing an infinitesimally small amount of doping with the Epsom salts. And if you notice the constituent color change, it went from perfectly clear 
with just that small sprinkling to a very, very gray type of material. And I believe that doping agent is now incorporating into the Epsom salt magnesium sulfate mix itself. And again, that's all that's there right now. So you see the very, very characteristic change in color. Now that went from white to extraordinarily gray. The next thing I'm going to be adding is just a bit of iron pyrite as a doping agent to the same said mix. Okay? So I'll try to get this camera situated so that it's stable. And you will see the next part of this. Again, just taking some of the iron pyrite. using the same diamond file. Not a lot. Just this material is infinitely harder to work with than the galena. Okay, so that's been added to the mix. And then again, I just sort of incorporate this like so. Brushing the extra stuff in there. But if you notice the color of that material is very gray. To this I will be adding the zinc oxide and also the silica gel. To which then we simply um, melt over the fire and then incorporate it into a cell. Okay, the next step is going to incorporate the zinc oxide and for grins I'm going to add titanium dioxide as well as tin oxide and I may even add a little bit of europium as a luminescent element to this mix. I would state the constituent of my original cells were nothing more than zinc oxide and this and I'm adding these adjunctive materials to see if we can glean any other wavelengths from this. Here is the silica gel that I will incorporate into this as well. So first things first we will add zinc oxide. I'll add a small modicum of titanium dioxide and tin oxide as well as the silica gel and then we'll take it to the burner. Okay so here we have the zinc oxide which is about 30 percent per volume, we have a small bit of titanium dioxide, which I'm incorporating as a crystalline nidus formation layer, as well as, for the first time, some tin oxide. Um, so we'll mix this into the Epsom salt mix that's been doped, and then we will add, at the very last, the silica gel. Okay, this is some europium. Add just a very small modicum of this, only because it's cool and it happens to luminesce in the dark. So I'm hoping that perhaps there's some latent energy that's accumulated with the europium that will have an effect on the cell. And then what I simply do is I've incorporated all the different oxides and I'll add some silica gel to the mix. as a means to capture a little bit more water. So about that. Then we will granulate this and we will cook it and we'll apply it to a cell. Okay, here you've seen that I've created a black oxide on this piece of copper in comparison to the one next to it. Utilized by heating on this surface, creating the black oxide on that surface. So that's the next step. Okay, here we have the constituent zinc oxide, tin oxide, 
titanium dioxide, europium, Epsom salts, and silica gel in a one cup stainless steel crucible. Here we have the copper with black oxide, as well as two pieces of magnesium. We'll cook this down, apply it to the magnesium, set the copper on it, and then we'll pull it. Okay, here is the reconstituted mixture that we've heated and melted. It's, I found it's very difficult to apply this when it's in its molten form. And I've been doing some experiments with uh, simply taking the byproduct of the melting of the salts, Epsom salt, zinc oxide. This one I have an experimental uh, utilization of uh, tin oxide. Um, and then I just simply reconstitute with a little bit of water to make a paste and then grind it into the mortar and pestle. I'll be applying it to the pieces of magnesium here. And I've taken you know, the piece of copper and trying something a little bit different here by scratching the black oxide just ever so slightly. And we're going to sandwich it there. Okay, and we'll go from there. And then this is just some extra material that I had made yesterday as reconstituted. And if you look very carefully, you can see all the little shimmering from the polycrystalline formation there. So in any event, that's how I'm assembling these things. And I lash it together with some PTFE tape and then polarize it with the leads from the dedicated power supply. So for what it's worth. This is one of those strips of magnesium that I obtained from United Nuclear Supply. Again, you can sort of see that it uh, appears to be like a zinc type coating. I sanded it off on the, this portion of it. This is what the metallic element looks like. It's somewhat pitted, you know, originally, just the way that this has been fabricated. A little bit shinier on this side. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be inserting this into this um, batch of the salts, okay? This is in a paste form. I'm going to embed the magnesium in that and then energize it vis-a-vis -vis this piece of copper so that the entire um, surface of this, both sides, is being oxidized, okay? And we'll show you the before and after. So again, this is the before. And I'm going to energize this with uh, 2 to 3 amps at 32 volts to produce as much of an oxide layer on this as possible. And then I'll wash off both the copper, which I've sanded here, as well as the magnesium so that you can see what that oxide layer looks like. Okay, guys, you can see how it's bubbling here. I have the copper. I'm placing it right down on this, activating it. It's obviously bubbling at this point in time pretty significantly. And you can see the disassociation there. I'll let this cook for a minute. And we'll see what kind of oxide layer we can get on this magnesium. Again, periodically I just place a little more of the salt on that piece of magnesium and place the electrode back down on it, trying to create as much of an oxide as I humanly can. I think the oxide layer actually works better if it's slightly more pasty than this. This is a bit liquid, but it should work still, hopefully. So in a minute, I'll take this apart. You can see all the bubbles there. And we'll wash it off and see what we're left with. So again, this is 32 volts at about 3 amps. So she's cooking pretty good. At least it smells like lavender. And again, that's the copper side and the magnesium side. So I'll wash this off and we'll see what we are left with. YouTube, this is the oxide layer that formed after the extended polarization. And you can see it's a very uniform, thin coating. Um, this is all dry. It doesn't come off at all. If you take a blade to it. It's a relatively hard coating. And again, just to show you that it is non-conductive, I have my two multimeter leads here. Place it on there. This is non-conductive. Take it to another continuity tester. Place in the magnesium which is here. Non-conductive layer. Now let's find another electrolyte that we can utilize for this layer to make a battery. After sitting for more than 24 hours, 
without any form of hydration or otherwise. So here we see an output voltage 1.67 it's one another voltage output 1.62 and this larger one here I'm going to place right here um, larger piece of magnesium and pure carbon We're showing one point or pardon me two volts okay we'll change it over to the current level let it stabilize I'll do this one first let it get back down to zero for a minute This is the large carbon magnesium based battery. Very le fairly low nominal um, microamp. That's actually one of the lower ones I've seen. Okay, then we'll go to the next one, which is this one, about the same. I think the tin oxide may have been detrimental to the actual current, so I don't think I'll be incorporating that constituent again. And here we have, again, a fairly low nominal milliamp current, about 6 milliamps. So we have 6 milliamps, we have 6 milliamps, and we have 7 milliamps. So, for what it's worth, the tin oxide may have decreased the current the voltage doesn't seem to be affected that great amount, but in any event, that's the characteristic uh, residual of those uh, cells. I made a few more. Let's test those just for grins and see where those are at from a current standpoint. Again, we're about six milliamps. This is just another. Another cell. Uh, so maybe 7 milliamps, okay, so a little bit larger cell, not by much, but a little bit. That could account for it, about 7 milliamps. So again, the tin oxide actually may turn out to be detrimental to the current flow. So for what it's worth, um, that's how I build those cells. So I'm continually experimenting, trying to add or subtract different constituencies to find what will give us the optimal amount of voltage and or current. So for what it's worth, um, that's how I'm building them. And uh, they do show promise. Um, again, these things have been dried for quite some time and have not added any water to it, so we'll see what they end up doing for the long haul. Thank you very much. Have a great night.